Sorry for the late start. Um, okay, so before I start, I am required to state that this material and any opinions expressed herein are strictly my own and not necessarily the opinions of RICO USA. Now that I've got that out of the way, I can actually start the talk. So I will be discussing uh, some performance and mainly memory problems that my team encountered in building a very large enterprise Angular 1 app. And uh, there's not going to be a lot that's, uh, there's a lot in here that's applicable to general JavaScript applications and some that is applicable only to Angular 1 and probably, uh, I think a lot of the stuff that we've had trouble with, they removed for Angular 2. So that's nice that they did that. Uh, my team's app is called Rico Total Flow Prep and it's for processing and formatting print jobs before sending them to large scale printers. These are printers for books, magazines, bake statements, that kind of thing, professional printing. Uh, my team's task was to port the product from Flex to Angular. Uh, if you've heard of Flex, I hope you never had to program in it. Uh, so we ported to Node WebKit because we had to run as a desktop application primarily and uh, secondarily as a web application. Uh, so this is a large application with a, shall we say, complex and multinational back end. Um, not, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a monolith, uh, and more than half of the team for uh, this porting operation is located in Romania, which put a strain on enforcing code conventions and quality. Uh, many of them are fresh graduates, none new JavaScript, on our side only two new JavaScript, and uh, neither of us had any experience with enterprise-sized applications. We were both uh, in web development before that. So, uh, it's as uh, Corinna said earlier, we had a lot of people coming from the back end and having to learn the front end for the first time using Angular. Um, our team tried to do the things that it says on the internet, you know, infinite scrolling, don't, don't use ng-repeat for that, and minimize the watchers. But by the time we were getting close to our first release, if you tried to load too many print jobs in succession, the app would crash. So this is what we learned as we fixed that problem. So it turned out that the reason we were crashing is that we were running out of memory. Um, this is a new thing to us people on the JavaScript side because we'd never made something so big before. And this could be uh, something new to a lot of people who have only worked in, in small web pages before moving into larger scale apps. Uh, what we learned was that the, the Java garbage collector is not interested in excelling at its job. Uh, any object can only be garbage collected if it's not currently referenced anywhere. This includes DOM elements. And so this means no pointers or closures on things that you want to have not in your memory anymore. Um, does anybody not know what a closure is? Just before I keep going. Awesome. So um, our mistake number one was, I took a DOM element out of the DOM, now it's gone. So that's not true. Um, so supposedly modern browsers make sure that a single reference, even a circular reference, between a JavaScript object and DOM object is, an, that's, you can still garbage collect that. Um, in practice, uh, it's rarely that simple. We would not have something that just had one pointer somewhere. We had multiple pointers. We didn't know where the pointer was that wasn't getting disconnected. So we ran into a lot of leaks in this area and we ended up with a lot of detached DOM nodes. Um, that is something you'll see if you look at a stack heap, um, at, a, at a, the heap uh, for memory, you'll see a lot of detached DOM nodes if you have trouble with holding on to those references. Um, I think of these as zombies. Um, it's, uh, it seemed as though the real problem was not the single circular reference issue that browsers can handle, but a problem involving multiple pointers to objects, including ones invisible to us due to Angular abstraction. Uh, essentially, if we had a reference to scope somewhere, and scope 
had a closure on it or a pointer to a DOM element, it wouldn't be garbage collected. So we had uh, a, large, uh, a lot of trouble with this. So in correcting this kind of problem, you want to avoid closures on DOM elements. Um, it's a, like I said, modern, the better we get with browsers, the better they are at handling closures, but we still encountered a lot of issues. Uh, it's, it's easier to um, just not do closures on them in the first place. Uh, and it's most easily done using the bind function in order to define context. And I'm just going to quickly look at bind in case there are people who don't know what it is. So I can aha, this direction. All right, so um, this is a contrived example. So hopefully it doesn't have some text. Uh, so I'm, what we're looking at here is I'm going to have a click handler that is actually in somewhere else. It's not in my controller. It's not in my directory. It's in just normal JavaScript. We use um, prototype-based, object-oriented JavaScript uh, in my project. So we have in, uh, in this handler, it says this. So it's going to work on the print job. Uh, so then later, in the... Uh, So later in my controller or my directive where I have my scope, I'm going to put things in the scope and then I'm going to have, uh, this is, this is like I said, a little contrived, but so my button click handler, I'm going to say job on click handler dot bind and then the first parameter here is the context, this that it's going to be called on. And then, um, I can pass in any parameters that I want in the bind here. And the invisible parameter here is going to be the event. So when this function gets called, the extra parameters that you see, so you do button click event, this is going to get added to the end of this list here on the bound function and come through right here in this parameter. Um, are there any questions about how this works uh, with bind? No, not, it doesn't seem like a lot of people use it, but I use it a lot. No. Um, so the big problem here is that uh, I now have job attached to something that's attached to scope. So in order to make sure that I'm not going to have a memory leak for the job object, and also the options object here, then I have to make sure that on destroy that I get rid of this pointer. Right. So, um, all right, next is uh, you should always remove listeners. I think most people know this, but uh, it's really necessary. Um, this this is like a major point of problem uh, where you have uh, an event listener that has a closure on something and it's in the DOM and then because the DOM has the reference it holds on to it and then that has a reference back it ends up uh, it ends up being circular a lot of the time not every time but it's best just to remove them every time. If you don't want to use something like jQuery to remove the listeners, you should very carefully study how things like jQuery do this because it's not just as simple as tossing it out. Yeah? Yeah, I do. Um, and I have those in some later slides, so I will, I will definitely try to get to those. So, um, yeah. So, 
if you have uh, if you have listeners registered on something, you have to deregister them somehow. And do not trust Angular to do it for you because it won't. Uh, Angular will do it only if Angular itself set those listeners on, in, say, an ng model or something like that, like deep down. If you set it using any kind of manual means, you should probably unset it using the same means. Um, and in our case, we use jQuery because somebody spent a lot of trouble getting it to remove things correctly. So uh, better than writing it ourselves. Uh, and you should always remove any pointers that you have. So if you have uh, if you've fetched a DOM uh, object, of course you want to keep pointers to them in the code because you don't want to keep fetching them out of the DOM. However, you have to make sure they're removed. Uh, if you have uh, a pointer anywhere in an object that still exists, then that DOM object can't be removed from memory. It will sit in the detached DOM tree forever. And you will end up with an unknown amount of things over there that you you can't tell that they're there. They're obviously not in the DOM. You can't reach them anymore, and yet they still exist. Um, the, the issue there is... Uh, You'd think that you've gotten rid of that object, but maybe that object is stuck in memory somewhere. And maybe you think you've got rid of the object that's pointed to that object, but its parent is stuck in memory somewhere. So you you never know how many things could tr could go back to be trapping this one pointer here. And I'm all the way over here thinking, oh yeah, I got rid of all these objects. Something was holding on to this one, therefore it was holding on the DOM object, and that DOM object is holding on to everything below it. Now, all the nodes that were below it in the tree. So if it happened to just be one text object, okay. But if it happened to be a whole div full of things, then you've got that whole div full of things stuck in memory. And if you keep repeat it, if you keep recreating it, it'll keep getting recreated again and again and again. And that's where the memory loop comes in. Um, all right. So, wait, did I miss anything here? Yes, I did. All right. So, um, right. This is the next slide. Perfect. You want to uh, remove the listeners from the HTML and jQuery, even though you're in Angular. Uh, sometimes this happens. Uh, we had implemented our view of our pages in a print job with a jQuery-based scrolling mechanism. And it leaked memory all over the place until we learned this critical information, um, which is in most cases you have to destroy the scope first, then the element. Um, and ideally you would destroy scope first using a convenient pointer to it, but we started off with this kludgy way that you see in the examples, and we refactored later on to um, not have to do all of this, but I left it here just in case this would be useful. So if you don't have a, a pointer to scope, then uh, depending on the settings that you have in Angular, you can get it available to you in this manner. Um, so this is like if I want to remove the element and all its children, first I would get the scope for these things, all of these things, and call destroy on them. You, this is the manual means of destroying the scope. And then I would say remove the element. And this is removing the children. Um, if you just want to remove without removing the listeners or destroying the scope or anything, use element detach. But don't do that and just forget about it because they'll all still be. Um, so here's an example from our code, uh, removing listeners from HTML and Angular. This is actual um, code for, it, it's a previous version of the product. So the, the adventure I'm talking about is uh, a little more than a year in the past. So let's see, yeah, you can see, you can see it. It's a little cut off at the bottom of the slide. Um, so we ended up naming this, giving this function a, a pointer that we can say on this and then off again at the bottom. So uh, I can't really see if I, maybe if I try and move that. All right, I cannot really draw on this slide very well. But uh, so up at the top in the highlighted thing on the right, you can see that the function I've got a pointer to the function so that I can remove it later at the very bottom of the screen. And uh, the safe destruct function that you see there on scope is something we added 
to handle what would happen when the scope was destroyed, and I'll come back to it later and show you how it works. Um, but essentially, this is the, the kind of removing of things that you want. So this happens um, when the scope is triggered to be destroyed, then the function inside of safe destruct is going to run, and that removes these elements that would not normally be removed. Um, a lot of times, Angular does remove the elements correctly. In this case, it wasn't, so we had to write our own. Um, so mistake number two that we made was that closures will take care of themselves. Um, this is not really at all the case. Uh, they're everywhere. There are there are several ways to avoid them. You can rewrite it so things in the scope get passed in as parameters. I like that one. You can just make it a method on an object. But um, my favorite when trying to refactor a large amount of code is to use binds, like I showed earlier. Uh, this works the same uh, with anything. You don't just have to use an event listener. It's extremely useful with callbacks because you can control context. Uh, that's a big performance improvement because the less, if you, as you create different scopes in JavaScript, you end up with, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the word, but there's each scope above you is like a big stack. And so you make another closure and it adds something to that stack. Then when JavaScript wants to resolve a variable, it has to search through each of these potential places that the variable could be all the way up to the window. And the number of these you have, as that increases, it slows down your performance. So you want to actually minimize the amount of places that JavaScript could be looking for a variable. And you can do that by saying, here's the context. of It's in this object. And then above that object is global. So you're only looking in two places. It really can speed things up. Uh, so. All right, um, the big problem is, with closures in Angular 1 is if you have a closure on a scope, don't do it. It's very bad. We'll get to that in a minute. So um, controlling closures, um, you can set a, clo a function that has a closure in it to undefined or null during the destru destruction of the scope, and that will get rid of it. Um, and you should really cancel timeouts and intervals and that kind of thing during the destruction of the scope. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna show you the how we did this scope destruction. So um, and these are kind of simplified and pulled out so that you can see how it works. So essentially how it works is there's a registry of things that will deregister uh, different watches different listeners, different, um, different things. So here's, a, here's the safe watch. And uh, I'm going to, instead of doing just watch, I'm going to do the same parameters as watch. But because watch returns its own deregister, then I put it to add deregistration. And it puts it in an array of deregistration functions. Then in timeout, I can do, uh, I can, instead of doing normal timeout, I can do safe timeout, and I have added this, uh, the deregistration of a timeout is a cancel, so I actually made a function that will do that and register it. So th this is an example of what you can do. I don't, I don't know if this is, this is like a pared down version of what we have, so you, you want to play with it to make sure you got it right. Um, then you can actually, uh, when you call safe destruct, then, um, oh, I should talk about this for a sec. So this is how you get a function to be available in every scope, no matter what. You can add it, root scope constructor, prototype safe destruct. Yeah, that is definitely messing with Angular a bit, but this, this came from one file that just does this to root scope and nothing else, and that's the only place that we touch root scope anywhere in the product. So it's it's reasonably contained. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call safe destruct on any scope that I want this to go through. And uh, anything that I want to happen on the end of this scope, I can end up with multiple callback functions being called. 
then uh, and I actually I'm gonna end up deregistering my destroyer listener just in case. And uh, then in this function that I don't have up here, uh, I'm gonna call every function that was in this registry here, one after another, and they'll all be to register every every watch, every timeout, everything that was in this scope. Now that the scope's gone, I don't want any of them. So in here, I'm gonna destroy references. And this function, which I also didn't include, essentially, and it's it's a bit longer than just this, it sets everything that isn't using a dollar sign at the front of it to show that it's an Angular based property. No. So then I'm going through and I'm getting rid of all the pointers to all the functions and methods and all of the things that are on the screen. So this is this is an example of how you can do it. Um, any questions about this before I So this was this was the number one thing that got rid of the majority of memory leaks in uh, in our product after we added. You have to I've made it so you have to actually call this on a particular scope. Some scopes this is not good. Some scopes you do not want to put this on there. Other scopes it's really good. So you have to try it out. Because sometimes when you do this setting everything to null, then uh, bad things happen. So it's a scope by scope. All right, so we had circular references, which are not cool. Um, we had a lovely reference to the body inside the event listener set on the body right here uh, in the example I showed you earlier. So whether this is enough to cause memory leak, I don't know. JavaScript engines might be smart enough to clean this up, but I'm pretty sure that we're in trouble. Um, it can happen with any kind of object, not just so avoiding circular references, there's a lot of literature about this. So I definitely recommend Google searches, um, but mainly you just got to keep who owns what, who's got a pointer to what, am I pointing all the way back again? Uh, it's helpful to use the Angular injection of dependencies properly to help keep this contained. Um, and you really want to avoid putting this into a closure, uh, unless you have a really good reason to do it. Uh, I've seen there was a lot of code that people would do var this equals this and put it inside like a promise. So they'd say var underscore this equals this, put it inside a promise handler, and then all of that is inside a function on this. And the reference there um, did not get cleaned up. It just stay forever. So uh, you have to be very careful. And really, again, I can't say this enough, use bind if you want this inside some other function. Just say bind this, and then this is this in there, too. It's nice. Um, yeah. Definitely use bind. I know I say that a lot, but I really love that function. It's my favorite. Um, all right, so we get to the crux of the matter here for Angular 1. Don't use scope inside a function of scope. This was, this was a number one problem in our product. That, right there. Um, the problem with this is that the way scope inheritance works, if you have a controller inside a controller, a directive inside a directive, etc., depending on your settings, you may end up with a child scope. The child scope inherits from the parent as though the parent instance is actually a prototype, not an instance. So that means that all functions that are on the parent scope are passed to the child. All functions on the parent scope are passed to the child as though they are a prototype. Yeah. No, the this in here is the scope. So because this function is actually on, it's scope dot whatever. The scope is the context for that function. So the this inside there is 
the scope. Uh, and that was the main reason we got to this point was that we had a lot of people who were confused about what this meant and where. So in the controller, this, like outside of this function, this means the controller. But inside that function, this means scope. And it was highly confusing. So all of these brand new JavaScript and Angular people, um, which is, it was a team of 30. There's a lot of people working on it. Uh, almost all of them went with the thing on the left where, okay, I am clearly calling select paper, which is on scope. The problem with this, as I was about to get to, is that um, imagine that this is in a parent scope. Now you have a child. The child has inherited this function. The, fun the scope inside this function is the parent. It's not the child. So therefore, the child has a reference to the parent in a function that you may not even realize the child has, so you don't even use it. It's meant to be on the parent. The child doesn't use that. Unfortunately, every child of this scope has this scope trapped in it, and therefore there's a circular reference to the parent because the child has a reference to the parent. And uh, that, was, that was a major problem. Um, so the, the big thing that my, that the, the safe destruct thing that I was showing you before, it chops off scope dot select paper handler and scope dot select paper it just chops them right off at the dot like this is null now this is null now this is null now so all of these pointers are no longer on scope and therefore that circular reference is cut and that's why it's a useful thing for if you can't control what your coworkers are going to write um, and like I said in my case the, more than half were in Romania and we did not have we couldn't just run over there and be like, quit doing this, because it works, so therefore it's good. Uh, yeah, that was, that was great, that part. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is something that I've, I've actually seen cases of this on the internet, too, um, examples, so I don't think we were the only team that would do this. Uh, and this is just, this is just the simplest possible example. We can, uh, working at this somewhere. Um, all right, so uh, our mistake number four was in thinking that scope was a good place to put things. Um, controllers, also a good place to put things. Well, actually, no. In general, an Angular scope is a really bad place to put things unless you're planning on rendering those things in the view. Uh, this is, again, because of scope inheritance. So the potential to retain a pointer on something is very large. Uh, for example, if you don't have a new scope in the child, and the child adds something to the scope that it, it's not a new one, it's the old one, you might think that you deleted that thing along with the child, but actually it was set on the parent, and therefore the parent now has a pointer to it. Uh, it has to wait for the destruction of the parent, and because, so here I'm talking about, um, let me, I think I feel like I, when did that one backwards? So, the, uh, imagine that you have a parent scope and you're not going to inherit. You're going to say, uh, scope is false. I'm going to have the same scope in the children as I do in the parent. Absolute same. Then you add something to scope in child. That means that that thing is, a, is all over the place. You don't know who's using it now. It, it becomes almost like a global variable. Uh, so the potential to retain a pointer to it somewhere is really, really large. The, um, so it, even without that, uh, with normal scope inheritance, you have the circular reference problem if you're, if you're unlucky. And even without that, then the child scope has a pointer to parent, making scopes a linked list. So these pointers don't always get removed when the child is removed. Uh, so you have to you have to be very careful, uh, right? And uh, if you created the scope with new, you also have to destroy it with destroy. Like that that we missed that one big time. Uh, not a good thing to miss. Um, right? So uh, dealing with this kind of problem. We want to minimize the scope contents. So, 
one way to control the contents on the scope is to use the other object to do the work. Um, in my app, we use Angular services for this. And uh, Corinna mentioned earlier, handling state is a bad idea in controllers, and I definitely agree. Like, this is a, a, a big point. Uh, it's not just for, like, readability of the code. It's for preventing things being trapped in, in strange places and causing memory leaks. Um, if you have, uh, uh, if you put a singleton inside a closure, it can't possibly cause a memory leak because that's, that singleton is going to be there for the length of the program. So it doesn't matter that it's trapped somewhere. You never want to delete it anyway. That's the kind of service I'm talking about. I'm not talking, so, so when you trap something in mem as a memory leak, it's something that you wanted to get rid of and now it's caught somewhere, like a like in a net. If you catch something, like uh, uh, if you catch something that's essentially immortal in the net, it doesn't matter that it didn't get. It, it's never we weren't going to garbage collect it in the first place. So this is where if you have to have a closure, single thing. Um, if you and we we made use of um, accessor properties to control the number of pointers on objects so that we knew exactly what had a pointer on what, everything else used an accessor to that object. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So, the, um, so here's, the, here's the example of, I'm going to use the service. So I have a closure on service, but hey, it's fine. It won't leak. I, I want it there anyway. Um, so I'm going to check for if, instead of putting X directly on scope, I'm going to check for inside this object that's on service or available through the service, etc. Uh, is this object around still? And if it is, then we're going to set it. Um, that's, this is like the basic way. And this is another way to do it, which does just about the same thing. So we're going to do object defined property on scope. The name of the property is y. And we're going to say that uh, the getter for the value of y is return if there's a helper object and helper object at y, we're going to return the y. Otherwise, returning 0. And this is a very basic example of how a getter function, you could, in, in our product, it usually has a thing here that turns it into inches or millimeters, depending on what country you're in, for example. Um, you're going to do, you can do a setter here. This is like super basic. Again, we don't, we have all, we usually have things that are checking is this a good input. And then you do configurable truth, you need to delete. If you, uh, and this is, this is like the one kind of thing where you actually do want to use the delete keyword um, because if you, in this case, because we're not controlling for it, if you said uh, scope.y equals null, um, it's going to end up being helper object.y equals null. And scope.y will still be defined just like this. You won't lose the definition. So if you wanted to get rid of it, you have to actually delete scope. Um, and this should have been this. Perfect. Um, yeah. Try. That's better. All right. So, um, wait, are there any questions about how accessors work? Boilerplate? Well, okay, uh, I'm not sure what boilerplate code is. Uh, no, I wrote an object that um, handles that kind of thing. And uh, so you would pass in. Uh, 
the property name and the getter and setter as um, parameters, and then the uh, object would generally inherit from that uh, from that or do an extend to get that, so that you didn't have to do object dot whatever. Instead, it's a it's a becomes a native function on the object, that object type, so that it can do getters and setters uh, without having to constantly put brackets everywhere. So yeah, um, and I actually I had some that would generate them automatically from JSON objects, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, where's my notes? There it is. Right, so. Um, minimizing scope contents to me includes minimizing watches. Uh, so this is really important for not for if you're going to have a watch that involves a local copy. Um, so the kinds of watches that involve local copies in like in Angular privately uh, are the equality watch, which is when you do. Um, the third parameter of the watch is true. So it's checking it deep, deeply into the object. Has anything inside this object changed? That means for it to compare the current object and the previous version, it has to have a full copy of your current object. And if it's large, then there you go. You've got, now you've got twice as much memory being used for one object. Um, the same thing with string references. Uh, if you have a big object in here, you can end up under the covers with the whole object being copied over and then Angular is just checking one thing sometimes. And this has been a little bit mitigated in, um, as, as Angular went along. So the earlier your version of Angular, the worse um, the string reference problem was. It was better a lot by, uh, I think it was 1.4 1, 1 or something. Um, so what uh, what I would suggest if you need something that's in a big object, then you should watch a function instead that actually goes in that object itself. And then what Angular is storing is the result of the function, and it's comparing the result of the function each time. And you can make that result be very small, so you end up with less memory usage. This is less memory leak-ish and more memory use-ish. We had a, we needed a lot of memory for doing large print jobs, so we could run out pretty quickly if every time we had a page in a print job, the whole page was duplicated. Every print job was duplicated. And every, you get the picture. It, it used twice as much as it should. So um, the example here, The example here is, uh, so I have a print job object, and I'm going to get a ring binding setting, and uh, I'm going to check, like, uh, I'm going to do these random things to figure out what the ring binding setting is, and it's a string or something. Uh, this would be what you'd return in the JSON object to set the ring binding on the print job. Then um, in my controller or wherever, I have my, uh, I have my watch here. And the first parameter of this watch is that function. So I'm watching the result of this function, and I've put the context to the job itself. So job is handling whether it changed. I don't need to know anything about whether job changed. I just need to know what function is called here. And then uh, I'm going to say do something about it if the setting changed here. And uh, again, because I've bound the scope, then I can call this inside the function. And this function can only look at scope and window, so it's really it's really quick. Uh, the uh, oh well, if it's in the yeah, so it's in the controller that the, the scope, and then outside in the controller you have the controllers, this, and then after that you have the window. So not too many levels there. And uh, then I have my unlistener. And if you don't do something like take the shark, you have to do something like this every time. I'm listening to Google Change Job. And this is, so this just tells it I'm done listening. Uh, and you might have to do this earlier. That's why they maybe pass it out like this. You might, have, you might say, oh, I don't want to, I only want to watch this once. Then you would do the deregistration right here. So if I were only going to, if I were only going to watch 
do this thing just one time, then uh, I would actually say right here. And then this watch would be gone, and uh, I never have it again. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, like I said, on the destroy event, you, you really need to get rid of the existing watches. Um, Angular gets rid of the ones that you put in the HTML really well. It does not get rid of the ones that you put in your controller very well at all. If it even tries. I'm not sure it even tries. Uh, yeah. Right, so, um, yeah, we, we had a lot of problems with cases cases of objects and functions retained in memory because watches were set. Just period. A watch was set. It stuck. Um, supposedly this was mitigated somewhat by the time Angular 1.5 came around, but by then we had already implemented all the stuff to do this, so I don't know whether it's better or not. Alright, so here we get to, um, actually before I move on I should ask if there's questions so far. Alright, so, the uh, way to know that you have a memory leak. And th these are, um, these screenshots came from Node WebKit's developer tools. As you can see, they look exactly the same as Chrome. Uh, these are a little older looking because this was, when I took these, it was for a company internal discussion of the issue at the time. So this is more than a year out of date, for, but it, it still looks mostly like this. There's just a few more options that they've added. Um, so the first thing for taking a, a heap snapshot to figure out what memory you're using, first, no debugging. And when you debug, it adds pointers to things. It, so then it adds things to your memory, and you didn't, you didn't do that. The debugger did. It doesn't matter who's doing the debugger, if it's in Chrome, if it's in any other browser, if it's in your IDE, any debugger, to do debugging and show it to you on the screen has pointers. So, yeah, you have to turn that off. Clear your console because the console also consists of pointers. Anything that you put in the console, there's a pointer to it. Um, it stays in memory until you clear the console. That means that if you are putting things in the console in production, then you have a problem because your, your customer is never going to go and clear the console. Uh, I mean, if you're just putting a string or a number, okay, fine. But if you put objects in, then it, it'll take up memory. Um, and uh, depending on how you actually do console like blocking, you can actually end up with the memory that would have gone to the console still being held somewhere. No WebKit did that to us. Uh, so we actually had to go through um, before release and get rid of every single console log. Um, and replaced every one of them with angular dot dollar sign log. Every one. Because there was no other way to do it. Uh, because it, nothing, nothing would be visible in the console, but if you check this heap snapshot that I'm about to show you, it was full of everything that was put to the console. So, alright, so then the next step, step is force garbage collection. You don't want to you, you probably don't want to start off with whatever was in the garbage before you started the snapshot. Maybe you do. But usually I start with, let's get rid of the garbage. And that, because that gives you a baseline of, once you've gotten rid of the garbage, what do I, what am I actually using in memory? What is actually, like, considered to be in use by the program? And you can actually have a higher looking memory because the garbage collection hasn't occurred yet. Uh, it doesn't occur just because something got tossed out. All right, so to take a uh, snapshot, you select number one, take a heap snapshot, number two, take snapshot, and uh, up in the corner there with a box that says number three, I know it's kind of small, that is what you click if you have already taken snapshots. You won't be able to get back to this screen. You have to use that button. And it's in the Profiles tab. So, um, this is 
after some objects should have been garbage collected, uh, then I'm going to say, okay, snapshot one was the load of the app. And it has 9.3 megabytes. Yeah. Then two and three, I opened and closed a new print job in the same window. So this is a desktop app. So I'm actually, I open something, then I close it. And I open something, then I close it. And each of those times after I closed it, I clicked on snapshot. So comparing two and three, you can actually see that there is a memory leak of 3.7 uh, megabytes in, this, uh, in the app as it was at this time. And also, well, Snapshot 2, there was some new compiled code in Angular, which we have no control over. Uh, that is part of the problem. Um, so comparing, when you compare the few snapshots, then you have um, the comparison option to view the differences in the summary to view all the memory to give you a couple ideas of what am I looking at. Uh, and we, we tended to sort by size delta to see the biggest thing and work on those first. Uh, it, but it was actually easier at the beginning to sort by constructor to see object type. So that leads me to my big tip is use object type. Um, we detected this leak here, and as you can see highlighted there, these, uh, these things were supposed to be um, destroyed when the print job was closed, but they're not. Here they are, sitting here. Um, in order to use typed objects, all you have to do is just, when you do the function, you give it a name um, in front of the parentheses. Not, so you can see not by whatever equals function with no name there. You have to put the name after the word function. And that's all it takes to get it to show up in this view. Uh, you can do that even if it's not supposed to be a typed object. If it's just a function with a name, you can do a lot better here. It's a lot easier to catch things. Um, so I just included this slide for if later you want to download, you can actually kind of see what do these things mean. These things in parentheses are, are kind of very difficult to debug. You, you can see, oh my gosh, I have so many arrays, but you have no clue what all of these 40,000 arrays are. Uh, and it's literally 40,000. So uh, usually what that means is it's internal to JavaScript. So these are actually the properties of an object in here. And that's why you can't really get rid of them. That's why there's so many of them. Object properties. That's how this, they're stored. So um, that's, that's kind of what you're looking for in here. The, the things that you can really do things about are the ones that are not in parentheses. And, the, and, and I load another job and try to see what's growing the most. So the more times I reload, then I can start to see, aha, object array closure and uh, scopes. Scopes were a big, big problem. So um, closure is also a big problem. And they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so then what you do is you click on the object to see what's retaining it. The objects in blue are closure. So there's a scope down there scope in system slash context that's in a closure. I mean, somebody has referenced scope and said this inside scope, probably. And I have to go track that down. Uh, I'm going to say, hmm, where, how do I track this down? Well, I can actually look at what properties are on scope by hovering over it. Uh, I don't have that slide. But that's essentially how it works. So if my scope is... Uh, my scope is, in this example, leaking via a watch that was not removed by ng-repeat. And this is not something that we added. This is something that Angular 1.3 added. And everything that we had in ng-repeat in 1.3 was leaked into memory. Every single ng-repeat. And it was fixed by Angular 1.3.5. So upgrading was good. So, um, this was the, this was, 1.3 was the point at which we had our app. And 1.3.5 was many, it was, it was a few weeks to months later. So we needed to fix it. And we ended up having to write our own ng-repeat-ish thing 
just to get rid of this problem, just for that release, and then later toss it out so that we can use the actual Angular one that we picked. Um, investigating this leads to the scope. Oh, I do have this slide. So um, I'm going to hover over the, the scope, and I'm going to look at what properties are in it. And I look at the properties attached to the scope, and I can see can print, current printer, um, find current printer. And I realize, oh, this is the printer dialog. There's a, there's a dialog at the top of the, of the app that lets you choose what printer you want. That dialog is not job specific, so it doesn't ever get destroyed between jobs, and therefore this is not the leaked scope. We want this scope to stay in memory. Um, it's supposed to be around still, so all right, I've gotten rid of that one. Now I only have another like bazillion yet to look at. Um, if you are not sure what scope it is, you can actually, uh, so, so you have 3,000 scopes leaking. Are you going to look at 3,000 scopes? Probably not. Or you can do something quick like this where you put a uh, object that has a name that's going to show up in constructor onto the scope. And you will know then that the scope has leaked because that object shows up in the constructor list. So I know that because I made this object, it doesn't really exist, it just exists right here, it does nothing. The fact that it exists in my heap, and even though this scope is supposed to be destroyed, well, obviously I have a leak. So we use this a lot. You would do this, look at the heap, and then go back and take it out of the code again. Um, all right, I have five minutes left. Are there, before I go on, are there more questions at all? about heap stuff. I have a, a couple references at the end of this of these slides that um, there's a couple places where they talk about it a little more in depth than I've had time to do today and uh, show you around a little bit more. Um, all right, so this is, we get to like basic performance, what everybody knows, watchers, yeah. They're, they drag performance. Everybody knows this. Engine repeat may not garbage correct correctly even after the fixes that they put in. So you can write your own repeater that doesn't use watching or you can use, uh, actually, if you don't need to watch that collection, put the dots in front, the two colons, uh, when you do the repeat. And that way it won't put a watch on the collection itself. But if you need to actually tell, like, uh, is this collection continuing and you're not going to be able to do that. Um, do I have five, five minutes left, or am I five minutes over, actually? Four minutes. Good. Good. All right. I didn't think I'd get to this point. I talked fast enough. All right. Uh, um, you should use the colon, the two colons in a filter if it's not going to change. Um, and uh, any, any place else, really, anything that's not going to change, put the two colons on it. You should only be watching things that are going to change. So the two colons say, don't watch me. You can resolve me once at load, then never look again. That is that is a big helper for speeding things up. If you can go through everywhere in the HTML and just put two colons anywhere you can think of. Um, yeah, the default settings of ng-model on, uh, on inputs, you, you really want a debounce on there. Uh, otherwise, it's going to keep going off every time you type a letter, and that can really slow things down. Um, I actually have, we have really large debounces of at least a whole second on ours just because we have a lot of slow typist customers, apparently, uh, and they don't like it when it saves something that they're not done typing. Um, you can get away with that. The, uh, um, now, uh, here's something that I found, like, I did a lot of Googling to prepare for this, and I found this a lot. There was a lot of people saying, use ng-if instead of ng-show as if it's a rule. Like, only use ng-if instead of ng-show the end. And that's a, that's so not true. You want to, um, if you're going to reuse something over and over again, you want ng-show because it's, it's a heavy, heavy drain to get rid of it and bring it back again. And if anything in there has a pointer, you've now caused a memory leak. And it's going to leak and leak and leak and leak and leak. You have to be very careful if you're using NGF that, you, that nothing is being held on to. Um, if you have a ton of listeners that slow things way down while it's hidden, 
with NG show, okay, then use NG. And I think that's why, I think there's a lot of people who have some large things with a ton of listeners that they're swapping around, and that's why they're saying, oh, you have to use NGIF. Well, frankly, the real advice here is refactor that. That thing is too big. If it's if it's so slow that NG show doesn't work because it's got a thousand listeners, and while it's hidden, then it's slowing down the product. That that sounds like there's a there's a want for some a little more tweaking there. Uh, and I have some tweaks that you can do in another slide. Hopefully I'm getting right soon. So, yeah. So here's the tweak. Um, you can add and remove watches as necessary. Uh, this is something that can be a little tricky. But um, essentially, I showed you earlier how every watch has a deregistration function. You can actually, it, it's actually in many cases a lower overhead to unregister and re-register as needed than to leave it in place. So when you know you've changed something, you can re-register things to prepare for that change. And then have the watches go through and unregister it again, and then it won't be watching things. And this is this is a difficult technique to because it's so, it's so nitpicky, but uh, if you're having low performance problems, this is really useful. You, you'd want to pinpoint this area has way too many watches, we're going to set up a system that turns them on and off again. Uh, then, um, if you want to toggle the watches that are set within the HTML itself, uh, I did find a few places where people are working on that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of places on the internet, they say, oh, just swap out your private watchers array with a blank one. And uh, you better watch out for that. That's uh, if you add another watcher while that watcher's array is swapped out, then it goes into a new the new array, and you swap it back in again. You're gonna end up with a missing watcher somewhere. Um, so yeah, take a look at those. And uh, all right, so you don't want to trigger unnecessary digests. Um, this is kind of I hope that people know about this already, but you can use a eval async to um, trigger only one. Uh, it, after all the digest is done, it does eval async at the very end and does not trigger another digest after that. Uh, you can use it whenever you can get away with it instead of scope apply or scope digest. Scope digest does local changes. Scope apply does app-wide changes. Don't get them confused because if you use scope apply when you don't need it, it's a very bad thing. Uh, when you have a large app, at least. And uh, I use the third parameter of timeout whenever I possibly can because I do not want to add scope apply any more times than I have to. If I'm using a timeout and I don't need scope to be applied at the end, false. So you just do timeout, your function, your delay, and then false. Just like that. So then it does not do scope apply. And Avoid using ng mouse over is my last thing. Uh, it could the scope apply gets called all the time. You should instead try to use ng mouse enter plus ng mouse leap. So you do try to do like you can kind of fake it by it entered. So I'm still in there, and then it exited, and now I must not still be in there. It, it works a lot of the time. Um, you can bind directly on the element by pulling it out using jQuery or whatever, and if you can't get that to work, and then uh, destroy it later. And this is what we ended up doing a lot of the time uh, for these mouse move off things, is we ended up having to, to actually do non-angular listeners just because the angular listeners were so expensive in terms of triggering digests. And, yeah. So, are there any questions? Um, so if you have uh, a named function versus assigning a function to a variable is a question. Uh, does it affect memory and garbage collection? So if you have it assigned to a variable, that means that the variable could be in a closure 
or it could be a pointer, and that can affect what happens to it. If you have it simply just, so if you don't ever refer to it again, then it will get just it will get taken out when that scope is finished. So um, it does depend on what context you're in. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of how to explain that, but so. In like the general use that I would use a function for, I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna have a pointer to it somewhere. Maybe it's on window. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's there. Just the one pointer, and call that over and over. Um, and in that case, there's no difference at all. It's uh, if you're passing the reference to the function around and it gets used here and closure there, then you start to have problems. Any other questions? I think my time is definitely up, so. Ah, uh, yeah? Yeah, I will, I will try to get the slides up through um, the conference stuff. And because uh, I don't have, I don't have it set up, sorry. But they will be available. Thanks.